Greetings, my brothers and my sisters, local and global. We love you with the love of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and we bring you a special Holy Ghost salutation on this great day of the church, May 31st, 2020. May 31st, 2020, the day in which the church universally, the church comes to celebrate its birthday. The day in which the Holy Spirit descended on the, the collection, the corporate witness of the believers, spoke through the disciples to the Galilean community and all of the people from the different ethnic groups heard the word of God in their own native tongues. The day of Pentecost is a day of inclusivity. It is a day of integrity, and it's a day of infinite power. We come to celebrate the day of Pentecost. Pentecost meaning 50 days after the day of resurrection. 10 days after Jesus ascended. It's also a day of obedience because it was when they were gathered together in the upper room that the Holy Spirit came down, spoke through them, and the people of Galilee that represented a multicultural, multi-ethnic, and multi-class crowd, assembly of people, heard the gospel of Jesus Christ in their own native tongues. I come to you today with a special slice of scripture. I come to you today from John's gospel, John chapter 7, verses 37 through and including verse 39 John chapter 7 verses 37 through 39 it says here that on the last and greatest day of the festival Jesus stood and said in a loud voice let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink whoever believes in me as scripture has said rivers of living water will flow from within them by this he meant the spirit whom those who believed in him were later to receive up to that time the spirit had not been given since jesus had not yet been glorified and so here we have it in verse 38 it says whoever believes whoever receives whoever internalizes in me as scripture has said rivers of living water will flow from within them and that 38th verse houses the word for today. It houses the theme for today. We want to talk about flow. F-L-O-W. Flow as a connotation for life. Flow as a connotation for rhythm, for cadence, for fluidity. Flow for connotation as a connotation for the ease by which God has allowed us to walk with him once we have his spirit inside of us let us pray father in the name of jesus we submit ourselves to you right now we block out any frustration any distraction any aggravation we bind the spirit of isolation and we focus on you holy spirit speak to us now for we want our being we want our bodies we want our heads our hearts we want our words and our witness to become rivers of flowing water bless this word today for people who are listening to us in person all over the world may they be blessed by your word in Jesus mighty name we pray and the people of God said amen so today we come to talk about the Holy Spirit and while the Holy Spirit is many things advocate the Holy Spirit is counselor the Holy Spirit is our lawyer the Holy Spirit is, is our is our instrument of peace the Holy Spirit is our testimony of hope the Holy Spirit is our bishop and our guide Today, we want to talk about the flow of the Spirit. The flow of the Spirit. Our world today is in serious condition. I want to submit to you that part of the problem of the world is a problem of stagnation, a problem of dysfunction, a problem of confusion. And what do you mean by stagnation? What do you mean by confusion? What do you mean by dysfunction? What I simply mean is a system, an organization, a system, 
a human being, a system, a city, a country, a system, a university, a system, a school, is suffering stagnation, dysfunction, discombobulation. When things are in the wrong place, when energy, when atoms, when molecules are not allowed to flow freely and produce the right functioning of that entity. And so the world right now is in dysfunction. Our cities are in dysfunction because people are in the wrong place because the rhythm of the organization, the rhythm of the company, the rhythm of the town, the rhythm of the globe does not create for the free functional flowing of energy from one point to another. And so when we spell the word flow, the first thing we want to do is talk about the freedom that we have in faith. The freedom that we have in faith. It's important to understand, beloved, that the Holy Spirit is the igniter of positive energy. That the Holy Spirit is a life-giving spirit. That the Holy Spirit is, is the one that enables the Christian to do what the Lord wants them to do. The Holy Spirit is the life giver. The Holy Spirit is what allows my frail body to be an overcomer and to do more than what my mind can think it can do. In my hand right here, I have a credit card. I got this credit card, amen, and I was not able to use it because though I had resources in the account, I was not able to download the resources. I was not able to apply the resources. The resources were frustrated. They were stagnated, if you will. They were imprisoned, if you will. They were incarcerated, if you will, because I had not done one thing to release the resources. That is to say, I had not activated the card. I cannot use the power of the card. I cannot use the principles, the protocol of the card, of the card because I had not activated it. And I'm here to tell you that the church today suffers frustration. The church today suffers di uh, discombobulation because we have not, if you will, activated the power of the Holy Spirit. So my prayer to you today, beloved, is, is that you have the F, the freedom of the fruit of the Spirit because you have activated the Holy Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit, you and I are nothing. Without the Holy Spirit, the church is merely a club. It is the Holy Spirit that gives us life. It is the Holy Spirit that gives us light. It is the Holy Spirit that gives us love. I was driving down the highway the other day and on, on our side of the highway, the traffic had basically come, trickled down to a stop. We drove about a mile and I noticed that on the other side of the freeway, there was an accident. There was an accident on the other side of the freeway. But I wondered why is it that an accident on the other side of the freeway is ca causing what we call go slow or traffic or dysfunction on our side of the freeway. And upon arriving at the place where the accident took place on the other side of the freeway, I noticed that there were several cars on our side of the freeway that had parked because they were also in minor or many accidents. And when I got through the traffic, I asked the cop, I said, what happened on our side of the freeway? The cop said that what happened, the policeman said, what happened on our side of the freeway was that people were not paying attention to where they were going. They had taken their eyes off the prize. They had taken their eyes off the road and they were looking at the accident that took place on the other side of the freeway. And therefore they created frustration on their side of the freeway and they began to hit one another. I've come by to tell you beloved, that if we are going to be all that God has called us to be, it is important that we concentrate on the things that are most important to us. And the things that are most important to us are the things that God has called us to do. Accidents happen when we take our minds off of the things of God, off of what has been designed with us in mind, off of the things that have been written for our purpose, for us to live lives of decency and deliverance. And we put our minds on things that we cannot control. And so I've come by to remind you, beloved, and si beloved, my brothers and sisters, that we need to allow our minds to be wrapped up in the word of God, wrapped up in the life of God, wrapped up in the life of the spirit of the Holy Ghost. That where there is God, there is freedom. Where there is God, there is fro. Where there is God, there is fruit. I have come by to tell you, beloved, that we need to be activated 
according to the Spirit of God. Where there is God, there is liberty. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And so, beloved, I encourage you that you must have the freedom that comes with God. Now, say, Brother Preacher, I, I, I need to know what do you mean? Uh, this is what I would say to you. There was a story told about a young man and his father they were driving the young man was about eight years old and what happened was he was they were driving through a town that they did not know and after a while they had some problem with the engine of the car and they had to pull over to the side for some reason i have cars on my mind today and they pulled off on the side and the older gentleman began to fix the car but every time he tried to do something, the car seemed to get worse. The little boy was rummaging around in the inside of the car while the father was on the outside of the car and the sky was falling, evening was coming. And all of a sudden, the young man stumbled upon the glove compartment and saw the manual of the car. And the young man rolled down the window and said, Daddy, 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 here is the manual of the car. Let's look at the manual of the car and let's fix the car. And the daddy said, no, I got this. And the young man about 10 minutes later said, daddy, here's the manual of the car. Let's look at the manual of the car and let's try to fix the car. And the man said, no, I got this. And a little while later, the young man said, daddy, it's getting late, I'm hungry. We need to fix the car. And the daddy said, no, I got this. And, and the young man said, daddy, but the one that made the car was the one that wrote the manual. And I've come by to tell you today, beloved, that we need to have the Spirit of God, we need to have the Word of God, because no human being made us. The one that made us is the one that gave us the manual of the Holy Spirit, the manual of the Word of God, the manual to fix us. And so the Word of God and the Spirit of God are two sides of the same coin. God gives us His Word and God gives us His Spirit. And the Spirit will tell us the things of God as long as we have the Word of God to read what the Spirit of God has to tell the people of God. And I've come by to tell you that the Word of God is the manual. Once we read the manual, we'll be able to fix everything that's wrong with human beings I've come by to tell you that if you want to spell flow you're gonna need a freedom of the fruit that comes from the Father but you're also going to need something else from the Holy Spirit and I've come by to tell you that if you're going to be a Christian this day if you're gonna be a believer you're going to need the Holy Spirit to lift you yes if I were to come into your living room today, if I were to come into your car, I would, I would suggest to you that maybe the spirit of the enemy has attacked your mind. And maybe he has attacked your mind the way he has attacked my mind. And maybe there's a threat coming against you this day, this week, that says you're not enough. All of us, flesh and blood, live with the threat that we're not enough. We live that I'm not man enough, that I'm not woman enough. We live with the spirit that maybe I'm not father enough, I'm not mother enough, I'm not Christian enough, I'm not disciple enough. We live that maybe we're not son enough, or we're not daughter enough, or we're not team member enough, or we're not classmate enough. We live that maybe we're not professional enough, we're not worker enough. We live with the spirit of not enough. We don't have enough money, we don't have enough time, we don't have enough mind, we don't have enough intelligence, we don't have friends, we don't have enough connections. And I've come by to tell you that that if you are a candidate for not enough, I've come by to tell you that God is a lifter of men, that God comes by to make sure that he fills in the gap, that your spirit of being not enough does not make you a sinner because we're all feeble and we're all finite and we're all fickle. And I've come by to tell you if that there's a spirit of the enemy that is knocking on your door telling you that you're not enough I've come by to tell you that you're not a candidate for the school of the enemy you're a candidate for the school of the eternal God specializes in those that feel that they're not enough remember now this is the day of Pentecost remember now Jesus has gone to the Father and many of them are wondering if they are going to be able to fulfill the promise that Jesus spoke to them while they were on earth. 
but I believe they were in that upper room and they were waiting for the coming of the Holy Spirit and I've come by to tell you right now that whatever God spoke to you in private you better get in public and remember it whatever God whispered to you in your closet don't allow the devil to make you forget because the Bible says that the Holy Spirit will bring all things to remembrance so I've come by to tell you to hang in there because if God spoke it you need to wait on it for those that wait on the Lord he shall renew their strength I don't care what the Lord told you I don't care how impossible it seems I've come by to tell you that God specializes in the impossible that even that, that, that the Spirit of God represents the presence of God and if you hold on on with God's word God's presence is still close by look at the Bible God chose the old Israel because God chose the old Israel as a model for the new Israel God chose the Old Testament as a foundation for the New Testament and when you look at the Old Testament ways of God you find that they are a pre-dramatization of the New Testament work of God if you look at what God did as God covenanted himself with Israel you get a sense of what God is doing as God covenants himself with the new Israel follow me my brothers and my sisters when God decided to call Israel God did not choose Israel because Israel was such a precious people God did not choose Israel because Israel was a high and mighty tribe. God did not choose Israel because Israel had military prowess, because they had a, a, a world beating political principles, because they had a global economy flowing through their economic veins. No, not at all. God, Elohim, God, Adonai, God chose Israel not because they were so great it was because they were so feeble God chose Israel because he wanted to use Israel as a trophy for his grace and his favor God chose Israel because he wanted to show what he could do with the least of these God chose Israel because God wanted to use Israel as an infomercial to the other nations of the earth that if they were to accept him as their Lord, as their guide, as their governor, as their king, that he could bring them out of darkness into the marvelous light. And so what God did was God covenanted himself with this backward motley crew of a community and God infused his spirit in them and gave them his word and his law and because of God's word they were able to emerge and do the miraculous among the nations because of God's word they were able to emerge from the dungeons of Egypt and be a light to the community because of God's word they were led by David in terms of worship and became a witness to the world because of God's word they were able to be seen as the light of the nations and to the Gentiles they were sent as an errand because of God's word they were light and salt and people call them a city upon a hill and so I've come by to tell you that God specializes in the least of these because the word says God will take the foolish things of the world to confound the wise and so if you feel like you're not enough if you feel like you're less than if you feel like you're inferior if you feel like somebody got their foot on your neck if you feel like you've been abandoned by grace I've come by to tell you that God does not abandon for God sits up high and looks down low he's all we need to get by God specializes in the least of these he's in solidarity with those that are oppressed and marginalized and devalued and degraded and God wants to move in so that when God finishes with you there will be absolutely no doubt as to your father is who your where your blessing comes from and where your favor comes from I've come by to tell you that even when you look at the book of Gideon and you look at Judges chapter 7 Gideon had 30,000 strong men ready to fight the enemy and God said they had too many so God told him to go through a plan a strategy of weeding down or winnowing down or cutting down his troops 
And so they cut them down and 20,000 plus went home and now they had 10,000. And Gideon says, show sure enough, 10,000, Lord, this all we got, let's go up against them. And God said, no. God said, you still have too many. Because even if you rout the enemy with 10,000, you will still think that the victory was wrought by you. So he told them, he gave them another test. He said, take them down to the river and let them drink water. And those that brought water to their mouths, which means that they could drink and still look to the promise. They could still look to the victory. They could still look to the plan. They could still look ahead. They still had vision. God brought them together and told the rest to go home. 300 men were used by Gideon. 300 men that in our carnal, human, finite eye would think it's not enough. 300 men God used to rout the enemy. I've come by to tell you that when you feel down, you're just enough for God. Let God move in and let God make the difference. So when God is done using your little with his much, you will be sure to give God all of the mighty praise. God is the lifter of men. God will get his glory. God deserves our praise. And I've come by to tell you, make sure that whatever you have in your life, big or small, you make sure that you bring it to God and let God bless it because God was the one that gave it to you in the first place. And so if you're going to flow, you're going to need the freedom that comes with faith. If you're going to flow, you're going to need God to be your lifter. But if you're going to flow with the Holy Spirit, I've come by to tell you that the Holy Spirit is an overcomer. Sister Gigi, I've come by to tell you that the Holy Spirit is an overcomer. Sister Toya, I've come by to tell you that the Holy Spirit is an overcomer. Deacon Logan, I've come by to tell you that the Holy Spirit is an overcomer. Deacon Robinson, I've come by to tell you that the Holy Spirit is an overcomer. That, that, that the Holy Spirit specializes in doing the impossible. And if you're going to hang with the Spirit, you're going to have to learn to distrust your own abilities. Because the Spirit deals with the spiritual. And a lot of times the spiritual will transcend the sensual. It does not make sense a lot of times when you walk with the Spirit. It does not make sense when God asks you to do something that other people are not doing. It does not make sense when God tells you to bring a young boy's lunch and he breaks up the pieces and turns that mountaintop into, amen, a restaurant. It doesn't make sense for Moses to be leading sheep and leave the sheep and see a bush burning amen and the bush amen is begin, begins to speak and he doesn't draw down but he draws near it doesn't make sense for for a man to send daniel to the lion's den and the lion does not eat daniel but but when they look again that daniel is with the lion's den singing gospel music it doesn't make sense for god to tell moses to stretch out his rod and have amen the red sea well up on both sides it does not make sense for God to tell a man to get well without getting wet. It does not make sense for Jesus to go over to Peter mom in laws house and give us some moral Advil and some spiritual Tylenol to drive her fever away. I've come by to tell you that God is a God that does not make sense. God will not be boxed in. God will not be limited. God will not be pinned down. God is a God that will explode us. He will blow our minds every step of the way. And so if you're going to lead with God and live with God, I've come by to tell you, submit your mind to God. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. And lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. I've come by to tell you that this Pentecost, God is going to do some miraculous things through our church, local and global. That God is going to do some miraculous things through this preacher. I've come by to tell you that there are some things that God has whispered that even though we can't believe, all we have to do is humble ourselves because God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. Draw nigh unto God and God will draw nigh unto you. I've come by to tell you that if we can just get with God and be like Elisha and put our head between our knees and block out all distractions and hear the voice of God as an overcomer which means we're not getting any interference but we're hearing God speak to us in the inward parts 
because the truth of life is when God speaks to you, he's going to speak to you on the level of your spirit anyway because the power of you and I to work comes first from the spirit to the mind and then to the rest of our being. And so what are you saying, Adela Khan? I've come by to tell you that, yes, we are mourning today as God is an overcomer. We are mourning today of over 100,000 Americans that have died, climbing up to half a million citizens of the globe that have died owing to COVID-19. I've come by to tell you, yes, there is mourning and grief because people have lost their jobs. Yes, there's mourning and grief today because there are frontline workers, amen, from London to Lisbon, amen, from Nigeria to Nairobi, from West Dayton to West Indies, I, 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 uh, who have lost their lives fighting this scourge. I've also come by to remind you, beloved, that sometimes it seems that those that should be leading us are not leading us through prayer, P-R-A-Y, but they're leading us through prayer, P-R-E-Y. I've come by also, beloved, to mourn with you on this Pentecost that it seems like there's a divide in the human race that some people believe because of the color of their skin that they are superior to others. And so from Atlanta to Houston, from Dayton, Ohio to Columbus, from Minnesota, people are taking to the streets because they are demanding justice. Oh, you search for justice, and what do you find? You find just us only on the unemployment line. You find just us searching, sweating from dawn to dust. There's no justice. There's only just us. I've come by to say it makes you wonder why it keeps from going under, that it, it boggles the mind. But I've come by to tell you that God is an overcomer because the answers to the problem, the answers to the disease of COVID, and the answers to the disease of colorism, the answers to the disease of health, and the answers to the disease of head can only come through the Holy Spirit of God, the paraclete, the advocate, the guide of our souls. Why do you say that? Because as important as the CDC is, the CDC is not the most important on earth. I've come by to tell you as, as powerful as the WHO is, it's not the most important entity on earth. The White House, the Congress, the UK Parliament, they're not the most important entities on earth. The medical establishments are not the most important entities on earth. Uh, the White House is not. The governor's office is not. The Senate is not. The school system is not. The most important person on earth today, May 31st, 2020, is the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God. He is a person. He has will, he has emotions, and he has intellect. I know some of our traditions like to refer to him as it, but I've come by to tell you that he is a person. He is the third person of the Trinity. He is a living soul out of him. If we, if we link up with him, we will have rivers of water flowing through us. He is the most important person because he sees all things and he knows all things and he searches the mind of God. In my, in my finite being, I only know the present. But the Spirit knows the past, the present, and the future. The Spirit knows us and knew us before we came. The Spirit knew that we will have to navigate this week and negotiate this year, 2020. But the Spirit is also waiting for us on the other side. The Spirit is also the one that is saying that you're going to get through it. That if you just trust and never doubt, he'll surely draw you out. The Spirit is our guide. And I've come by to tell you that if we can just have the mind of God, if we can just have the mind of Christ, if we can just be led by the power of the Holy Spirit, he will show us how to build community in the midst of chaos, how to have deliverance in the midst of disaster, and how to work for justice even in a time where it seems that, that God has moved away and left no forwarding address. So I've come by to tell you that he is the overcomer. But beloved, above all, I've come by to tell you that there is a W to flow. And when you talk about the Holy Spirit, he is a freedom giver, he is a lifter of men, he's an overcomer. But I've also come by to tell you that the Holy Spirit is our witness to whatever we need. The Holy Spirit is our witness to whatever we need. 
What I mean by whatever we need is not whatever we want, but whatever we need to fulfill the promise of God on our lives. For he said that we shall have life and have it more abundantly. The Holy Spirit, beloved, was the one thing that Jesus Christ promised to us before he left the earth. He did not promise to us money, treasure, university degrees. Those are all good things. He did not promise to us church committees or church choirs. He did not promise to us that we would have knowledge to conquer every disease. But he did say that I will give you a comforter. He said, I will give you another advocate. I will give you another counselor. In other words, I will give you me in another form. Because as long as Jesus remained in the flesh, he is limited by the receptacle of his corporeal being. But now that Jesus gives us another Jesus, because according to the book of Acts, the Holy Spirit is also called the Spirit of Jesus. We have Jesus living inside of us that will do our thinking for us and our living for us as long as we submit to him. I am somebody who loves sports and for those of you who are mourning perhaps the lack of sports around the world, I tell you I grew up playing soccer and I had great ambitions to be a wonderful soccer player. I used to organize the neighborhood guys and we would get together and play with other neighborhoods. We, we, would, we would have neighborhood soccer tournaments. And I remember when I was about nine years old, we had a pretty good team. We were good. We would thought we were better than good but we were probably just okay and what we did was there was another team that seemed to be pretty good as well that we believed that we could have a showdown with them and show them what we had the skills that we had with the ball we had a pretty good team and so beloved we designated the day it was going to be a Saturday afternoon four o'clock we were going to meet at a particular field amen in Abelkuta Nigeria and what happened beloved was we worked on that game for two weeks Oh, we got our uniforms together. Oh, we got our socks together. We got our soccer cleats or soccer shoes or soccer boots together. Oh, we told our parents and we got, told all the people in the school, beloved, we even had what you would call a cheerleading team. We told everybody. We told our parents to tell the, the folk on the job, we got our food, we got our water, we got the field. We, we put out everything. We, we, uh, for lack of a better word, we put out a press release. We were going to have this great tournament game against this other team. Beloved, so on that particular day, we packed up, got everything ready. Our shin guards, our socks and everything, got our uniform, got our cars, and we got down to the field. And we warmed up. And right when we were warming up, we had everything except what we needed to play the game. We did not have a ball. Beloved, I've come by to tell you, Perhaps the message of this Pentecost is this. You can assemble everything you want. You can collect knowledge, skill, competency, connection. But if you don't have the most important thing, which is the Spirit of God, you have nothing and you can't play the game of life. And so, beloved, we have the Spirit of God because the Spirit of God gives us freedom. We have the Spirit of God because the Spirit of God gives us life. We have the Spirit of God because the Spirit of God enables us to overcome. We have the Spirit of God because the Spirit of God gives us whatever we need to overcome. And so beloved, as you walk through this week and as you go into June, I ask that the Holy Spirit open you up to new dimensions of God's being. I close with a story from the New Testament. I have been meditating all week upon that widow in Luke chapter 18 that went up against a judge that neither feared God nor regarded man. Remember that widow went to that judge not to hang out with the judge, not to exchange emails with the judge, not to, not to have uh, idle chit chat with the judge, she went to the judge because she believed that the judge would be the repository of justice. 
She went to the judge because she believed that the judge in a position of accountability will hold other people accountable. She went to the judge because she believed that the judge would be a touchstone of righteousness. She went to the judge because the judge was an office holder and was a representative of everything that should go right in society. But why did she go to the judge? She went to the judge because she had an adversary. She went to the judge because somebody was oppressing her. She went to the judge because she felt devalued, because she felt degraded. She went to the judge because there was something not flowing in her life. She went to the judge because her life did not have the cadence, the rhythm, the power, and the favor that she knew she was entitled to, though she was a widow. Look at this widow, y'all. She was once married and now no longer married. She had little connections to the resources of society. She had no connections to those that govern the ideas, institutions, and individuals of society. And upon that, beloved, she was being taken advantage of. Life was being drained from her by an adversary. And so, beloved, you could say she didn't have one count against her. She didn't have two counts against her. She didn't have, she had three counts against her. She was widowed, which means that she was not somebody who enjoyed a lot of social privilege. She was somebody who was taken advantage of she had an adversary maybe somebody was taking her property maybe somebody was haunting and harassing her every day at any rate we know that that person was draining life from her that's the implication and the connotation of the word adversary and then thirdly the person that she was going to in order to bring fairness and justice and righteousness to the situation seemed to ignore her and turn the back of rejection towards her but I want to know why does God bring her into focus and I have to be honest with you beloved I have always seen this woman as a widow and I've always preached her as someone who didn't have anything and God told me to look at her again for the purpose of this sermon I said, God, I know about this woman. I know she's in Luke 18. I know that she went to the judge and the judge didn't fear God or man. I know that she wore the job. And God said, look at her again. God turned my lens around. God changed my hermeneutics. God, 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 God gave me a new mind. God told me to visit this woman again in the words of Wordsworth for the first time. God said, you're looking her at her through the lens of a widow, you're not looking at her wealth. You're not looking at all the things she did not need. She did not go to the man and ask the man for a job. She did not go to the man and ask the man for wealth. I said, Holy Spirit, speak. I had to repent, repent in my prayer closet this week, y'all. I have not looked at this woman the right way. I was looking at her as a poor woman. I should have been looking at her as a rich woman. God said, look at all the things she did not ask for. She did not ask for a home. She did not, not ask for a handout or a hand up. God said, look at her for her wealth. And then I began to see that with what she had left, she overcame. With what she had left, she persevered. With what she had left, she was determined. And that is the power of prayer. And that is the presence of God in her life. And that is the power of God and the favor of God to do the impossible. And the Bible says that the judge had to change his mind because the woman kept on coming and kept on coming and kept on coming and kept on coming and kept on coming. And, kept on coming. and I've come by to tell you during this period that though you may feel that you're left out and shut out and left behind, God's spirit will allow you to keep on coming and keep on growing and keep on moving and keep on expanding because look at what the judge said let this woman 
wear me out. In other words, the man is confessing that prayer will wear out whatever force is out there that has no regard for you or has no regard for God. That the focus of the text is not the judge. The focus of the text, the subject of the text, the agent of the text is the woman who was a widow who seemed to have little, but she had much because she had prayer. God will make up the difference. God will make up the gaps. God will allow us to overcome for those that wait on the Lord. He shall renew their strength. They shall mount up on wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. One man with God, one woman with God constitutes a holy majority. This is my offering to you, saints live with the power of the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit will make you run when you don't feel like running, will make you give when you don't feel like giving, will make you live right when you don't feel like living, and will make you forgive when you don't live like forgiving, will make you give thanks when you don't feel like giving thanks but the Holy Spirit is God using you to do something impossible in the world. This is your prayer this is your proclamation this is your praise, the Holy Spirit. This is my offering to you, to Kumbo Delacan from the Tabernacle Baptist Church. God bless you.